Welcome back to chapter 12. Um, today we are going to be discussing factorial ANOVA. So um, last module we did the first half of chapter 12 where we talked about one-way ANOVA and Tukey's HSD. And today we're going to be doing the latter half of the chapter 12 slides that focus on factorial ANOVA. Okay, so a factorial ANOVA is uh, when we have multiple factors that we are um, predicting are going to affect our DV. So those multiple factors are going to be multiple independent variables. Whereas um, when we were doing a one-way ANOVA, there was just one independent variable, and then that independent variable had three or more levels or three or more groups, three or more conditions. So a factorial ANOVA is different than a one-way ANOVA because in a one-way ANOVA they're predicting one factor will have an effect on the DV or one IV will have an effect on a DV. But with a factorial ANOVA, the prediction is that multiple factors will have an effect on an on a DV, um, or you can test multiple factors at once on a DV, and those factors are your IVs, of course. So when there is more than one IV, the ANOVA is a factorial ANOVA. In other words, we do a factorial ANOVA when we have two uh, independent variables or more, and each of those independent variables has multiple levels. So for an example of this, if you look on the slide, you can see that block of cells and it has two independent variables. Um, on the rows, you see male and female. So the independent variable there is gender with two levels, male and female. And then on the columns, you see attractive and unattractive. And so uh, attractiveness is our second variable. And there there's the uh, two levels of that represented there in the columns. Um, and so that gives us a total of four groups. And the way that we would write this out, if you uh, look on the video, you can see that you would uh, make space for each variable that you have in your design. So in the example we're looking at now, we have two variables. Um, and so we have space for those two variables. And then what goes on the line, the number that you write or the number you put in the space designated for each variable is the number of levels that that variable has. So you see the K there on the slide or um, on your screen and that's representing the number of levels for its respective independent variable. So in this top example on the slide, we have two IVs. So we have space for those two IVs. The first one is attractiveness and the second one is gender. And then we have two levels of attractiveness. So we have attractive and unattractive. So the K for variable one would be equal to two, those two groups, attractive and unattractive. And then our second IV is gender. So we have to make space uh, for that IV. And K for that IV is also two um, because there's two levels of gender or two levels of IV two and the two levels are male and female. So the K is equal to two. So if we were to write this out symbolically, we would uh, represent it by saying we have a two by two factorial ANOVA. So then in the next example on your slide, you can see that a condition was added to the attractiveness independent variable. So now K is three for this second example. So it says attractive, unattractive, and no info. So uh, this is going back to that, uh, and the same with the previous example, I just forgot to say it, but this is going back to um, this example we talked about before where the question is kind of does attractiveness of a, a defendant affect the jury's perception of their guilt or innocence. Um, so in this example, the um, participants in your study would get a case file and they would all get the same case file. The only thing that would be different between the conditions would be the photograph that they see. And so in one condition, they see um, an attractive, in this case, either male or female defendant. In another condition, they get an unattractive uh, photograph with their case file of either a male or a female. And then in the third condition, they get um, the same case file and they're told the defendant is either male or female, but they don't get any picture whatsoever. So in this example, uh, if we wanted to write it symbolically, we would make space for our two IVs of attractiveness and gender. And then in addition to that, uh, we would need to add our Ks 
um, into those spaces. So the K for attractiveness is now going to be three and the K for gender is still going to be two. So we would say that we have a three by two factorial ANOVA. So um, with a factorial ANOVA, there's still three sources of deviation. There's just one change, um, but there still is going to be that sum of squares total calculation where we do the same thing we did with a one-way ANOVA and we look at each um, scores deviation from the overall mean and then if you kind of skip down visually on the slide here to number three where it says within you're still going to calculate a sum of scores within the same way you did on a one-way ANOVA and that calculation is uh, the deviation of each score from its own group mean it's still our measure of error our measure of individual difference um, but what's changing here with the factorial ANOVA is that you have additional measures of your between uh, source of variance so or your between group source of variance so here because you have two IVs what we're going to do is label one IV A and one IV B and so uh, it looks like here that IV A is uh, gender and the two levels of that are going to be male and female and then IV B is attractiveness and the three levels of that are going to be attractiveness unattractiveness and no info so what we uh, can do is calculate these um, things called main effects. And main effects are the portion of the between group variability that is due to each IV separately. So what that means is we want to know uh, the difference, for example, for main effect A would tell us the difference um, between perception of guilt um, based on if the defendant is male or female. And then uh, main effect B is going to tell us uh, the difference in the effect on guilt between whether or not the person, uh, the defendant is attractive, unattractive, or if the participants aren't given any information about their attractiveness level. So we're looking to see main effect A is that IV's effect on the DV, and then we look separately at main effect B and that IV's effect on the DV, and then also we are going to uh, measure the interaction of the two variables. So when the A, uh, the IVA and IVB come together, how does the interaction of those two variables affect the DV, or does it affect the DV? Um, so an interaction effect is when two or more IVs act in combination or interact to produce group variability. So basically, the question is, is there any effect on the DV due to the combination of these two IVs together? Uh, so for example, folic acid and zinc have to be taken together to increase a uh, sperm count. So um, they only work to increase sperm count if they are given together. So an interaction effect is required between folic acid and zinc in order to increase sperm count. If you just looked at folic acid on sperm count and labeled that main effect A, you would not see a significant difference in sperm count. If you just looked at uh, zinc and its effect on sperm count, you would not see a significant difference in sperm count between those who take zinc and those who don't. Um, but if you looked at people who took folic acid and zinc together versus people who did not, you would see a significant difference there. So an interaction effect looks at the combination of your IVs together and how it affects the DV. So we'll be looking at the formulas in a moment um, to calculate these new measures, main effect A, main effect B, and the interaction effect. Um, but you should know a couple things. The in a factorial ANOVA, the sum of squares within and the sum of squares between um, and all its associated subgroups, so um, main effect A, main effect B, and the interaction, those should total uh, your sum of squares total and your degrees of freedom total in the same way that they did with a one-way ANOVA. The difference here is that you want to think of this uh, between a source of deviation as being comprised of three subgroups. So if you took the sum of squares that you're going to calculate for main effect A, the sum of squares you calculate for main effect B, and the sum of squares you calculate for your interaction, those three sums of squares should add up to your uh, sum of squares between groups. So they act as three measures of between group variability or three subgroups of between group um, variability. And so uh, when you do these formulas, you're going to end up with, in this case, uh, three Fs. 
And so you are going to need to evaluate each of those three Fs. And this is different than a one-way ANOVA because with a one-way ANOVA, we just had to evaluate one F for significance. Here we'll have to do three total F ratio evaluations, one for each main effect and the interaction. So in that example, we would only have to evaluate three F ratios because um, we only have two IVs. But if you add a, another IV, then you're actually increasing the number of F ratios you have to evaluate by a lot. So here, if you look on the slide, is an example of a three-way ANOVA. And so we have the same two variables from our previous example. We have um, attractiveness in our columns and attractiveness has its three levels, attractive defendant, unattractive, and no info on the attractiveness of the defendant. And uh, then we also have gender as our second IV, and so there's two levels of that, male and female. But what's going on here is the introduction of a third independent variable, which in this case is type of crime. So in addition uh, to your participants getting information about the attractiveness of the defendant, the gender of the defendant, they will now also be getting information about the type of crime that the person committed. And so we're interested in the effect of that on perception of guilt as well now. So you can see this reflected on the slide. Uh, you have your two sets of blocks of cells, one for property and one for person crime. And then each of those uh, blocks of cells have uh, the IVs and their respective conditions represented. So you can see attractiveness, unattractiveness, and no info in each block of cells, one the property crime cell and the person crime block of cells. And then you also see gender reflected there on each block of cells as well. So that's how we would draw out um, this block of cells. And then what we do is when we get the scores on the DV, we put them uh, the means inside those blocks of cells, which you'll see on the worksheet and homework coming up. But at any rate, if we did have this design, we would have a three-way ANOVA because we have three groups. I'm sorry, we have three IVs. And then the way we would write that out symbolically in this case is to make space for each of those three IVs and then um, write the, the K for each one in the respective space. So the first space could be for gender, and that would be two. The next space could be for type of crime, and that would also be two. And then the last space could be for attractiveness, uh, and that would be a K of three, because there's three levels of that. So we would call this design a two by two by three factorial ANOVA, and uh, we would have three independent variables. And what would happen as a result of this is we would actually have seven F ratios that we would need to evaluate. So we would need to evaluate main effect A, which would be gender on perception of guilt. We would also have to evaluate the F we get from main effect B, which would look at uh, the effect of property versus person crime or type of crime on uh, perception of guilt, our DV. And then we would have to evaluate the F ratio we get from main effect C, which is going to be our third variable, attractiveness. And then we have to look at every possible interaction combination and evaluate the F ratio for those. So uh, an A times B interaction, so gender um, and property crime, what are the, or gender and type of crime, what are effects of those on the DV? We'd have to look at an A by C interaction, which in this case would be gender and attractiveness together. What are the effects of that on the DV perception of guilt? We'd have to look at B by C, so that would be type of crime and attractiveness on perception of guilt. And then we would have to do all the main effects combined and there effect on perception of guilt, our DV. And that would be a three-way ANOVA. So here are the formulas and steps for calculating through a factorial ANOVA. Um, this is just kind of a quick reference sheet of formulas uh, that you can refer back to. Um, but we do have a very detailed worksheet coming up that we're going to go through. Um, so some of the steps to point out are that first you have to um, before you even start your calculation, draw these blocks of cells we've been looking at. And one IV is set up in the columns, the other IV is set up in the rows, and a cell is where the row intersects uh, the column. So once you have your block of cells set up in each IV and uh, respective level of that IV um, kind of represented in your block of cells, then you're ready to start your calculations. So first you're going to calculate your sum of squares total the same way you did that in a one-way ANOVA. But this time I'm going to ask you to 
uh, isolate or identify what's called the correction factor. And the correction factor is calculated by adding up all your raw scores, then squaring them and divided by n. And that correction factor is used in other formulas in the factorial ANOVA. So rather than doing the whole formula every time, you'll just be calculating that correction factor once and then uh, using that, over, that correction factor value over and over again. So you don't have to do the same calculation more than once. After you do that, you're going to move on to calculating sum of squares between, and uh, the formula for that is represented here on the slide. This particular sum of squares between looks like it has uh, four groups in it. Just like with a one-way ANOVA, you need to adjust the formula to represent um, all levels of all IVs. And then you have the sum of squares uh, within groups calculation there, uh, which is the same as um, it was on your one-way ANOVA. Uh, you just subtract the between groups from the total, or you can look at that entire formula on your one-way ANOVA sheet. So you have two options for calculating that. And then you have uh, the new steps here that you didn't do in one-way ANOVA, which is to calculate your sum of squares uh, for main effect A. So if main effect A is represented by the columns in your block of cells, um, in some cases, main effect A might be represented in the rows, so you would just need to look at your summary table labels uh, to see which IV is A and which IV is B, and then adjust your formulas accordingly. Um, but what you do is you take all of the raw scores for column 1 and add them up, and then square them and divide by the number of uh, people in column 1. And then you do the same thing for column two, add those two values together and subtract your correction factor. And then you're going to need to calculate the sum of squares for main effect B. Um, and so again, you'll need to make sure main effect B is on the rows um, and not the columns and adjust your formulas correctly um, or as needed. But in this case, let's say that uh, B is on the rows. So what you would do is add up all of the raw scores for row one square them and divide by, or square that value and divide by the number of people in row one. And then to that you would add um, all of the scores for uh, row two together, square them, divide them by the number of people in row two, and then add up your two values and subtract the correction value. And then for step six, you can calculate the interaction by um, taking your sum of squares between groups minus your sum of squares main effect A, minus your sum of squares main effect B. So then you're going to need to set up your summary table, um, and it's going to look pretty similar to your one-way ANOVA, um, but you're going to have the addition of your main effect A, B, and your interaction. And so you're going to calculate your sum of squares using the formulas I just showed you. Um, sum of squares total and within groups is the same as one-way ANOVA, but your sum of squares for main effects A and B and your sum of squares for the interaction are new for factorial ANOVA. So you would put those values in their uh, correct locations and then you would move on to calculate your degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom within and total are the same as a one-way ANOVA. Your new degrees of freedom calculations that you haven't seen before are degrees of freedom main effect A, which is the number of columns on your block of cells minus one. And then your degrees of freedom for main effect B, which is the number of rows on your block of cells minus one. And then you take those two values you just calculated, your degrees of freedom for main effect A and your degrees of freedom for main effect B that you just calculated, and you multiply them together, and that's your degrees of freedom for your interaction. So then you get your mean squares the same way that you did on a one-way ANOVA. Uh, you basically just go across your summary table dividing um, the sum of squares by its appropriate degrees of freedom. Um, so you do that for your main effect A, B, interaction, and uh, mean square within group. You do not have a mean square total. So before we talk about how to get those F ratios, it's important to point out that here on this summary table for a factorial ANOVA, you do not see a between groups uh, spot. So there's no sum of squares between groups or degrees of freedom between groups um, because instead that be between groups variance or source of deviation um, has been broken down into three parts. So it has three subheaders or three subgroups you can think of them as. So the subgroups for the overall between group 
uh, source of deviation are your main effect, A and B, and your interaction. So just like in a one-way ANOVA where we divided our between groups into our within groups uh, to get our mean squares uh, between groups into our mean square within groups to get our F ratios, now we are going to do the exact same thing, but in this case, we're going to uh, divide all of our sub between group values one at a time into our within group uh, mean square. So we're gonna take mean square for main effect A and divide it by mean square within. We're gonna take mean square main effect B and divide it by mean square within. We're gonna take our mean square interaction and divide that by mean square within. And that's gonna render us three F ratios and so uh, basically you would evaluate those F ratios for significance the same way you evaluated the one F ratio uh, using table G. And so uh, instead of just evaluating the one F, you need to evaluate each F individually and then put a um, conclusion in the P column next to your F ratio on your summary table. And so your conclusion options again are uh, less than 0.01, less than 0.05, or NS. And so if your F ratio beats your critical values on table G, then you're able to reject at the appropriate level. You'll also be needing to graph and explain the interaction. And so to do that, you need to make sure you have your um, block of cells with the means for each group inside each cell. And then the interactions are the means of uh, each row. So you take a row and you calculate the mean. If it's a two by two factorial ANOVA, you're gonna take uh, the, two val the two means on the top row, add them together, divide by two, and then that's gonna be your interaction mean that would go outside the table for that row. And then you do the next row and then you do the column. So I'll, I'll show you that on the worksheet. Um, it's easier to just kind of see it than to hear, hear about it. Um, but anyways, you need to have that summary table with the means placed in the proper locations. Um, and then what you do is you draw a X and Y axis. And on um, the X axis, you're going to put IV number one or IV A um, and the uh, levels of that. And then you're going to put your DV um, on your Y axis. And then your next IV is going to be represented in like a key off to the side. And so you'll use uh, solid lines to connect the data points on your graph uh, for one level of IV2. And then you'll use dash lines to connect the data points on your graph for uh, the second level of IV2. And then you look at the interaction and if the lines cross each other or if they look like they would cross if they continued on, um, then you would expect to have a significant interaction. But if the lines are parallel to each other, then there is not going to be a significant interaction. So that's all a little bit hard to grasp verbally, but I'm going to show you on the worksheet coming up in a couple minutes. So if in a two-way ANOVA an IV has more than two levels, then the calculation remains the same. You just adjust the formula to represent all levels of each IV. But the evaluation of those Fs does change slightly if you get like a two by three factorial ANOVA rather than a two by two. So the two main effects will have different degrees of freedoms if the IVs have a different number of levels. Like in the case of a two by three factorial ANOVA, then main effect A is going to have uh, a degrees of freedom of one and main effect B is gonna have a degrees of freedom of two. In this case, you would need to look up two sets of critical values in table G. So one set of critical values for main effect A at the 0.01 and 0.05 levels, and then um, two critical values for main effect B at the 0.01 and 0.05 levels. So you do not need to look up anything for the interaction. If the F for the interaction is equal to or greater than any of those four critical values you looked up for the main effects, then you can reject the null. So I will show you an instance of this on, I think, the last page of the worksheet. Okay, so go ahead and get your factorial ANOVA worksheets out, and we will um, go through several examples of how to calculate through uh, factorial ANOVAs. Okay, so welcome to the factorial ANOVA worksheet. This specific problem here on this front page 
is a two-way ANOVA. So a two-way ANOVA tells me that there are two independent variables with multiple levels. So let's read the sample problem and see what those levels are of those two uh, IVs. So it says a researcher is interested in the effects of both diet and exercise on percentage of body fat. So if I were reviewing this sample problem on a quiz or on a homework, I would want to go ahead and isolate this hypothesis, uh, which here is. the effects of both diet and exercise on percentage of body fat. So just from that um, hypothesis, I'm able to deduce what the IVs and DVs are. So um, it's interested in the effects of both diet and exercise on something. So diet and exercise are gonna be the cause and the effect is gonna be body fat. So I know that here I have two IVs. I have diet as IV number one, and I have exercise as IV number two, and my DV is body fat. So the way they're going to test that hypothesis is by taking a sample of 20 male high school sophomores, they're randomly selected, the subjects are then randomly assigned to four different treatment conditions. Okay, so something else worth isolating and kind of making a note about here are the fact that it states there are four different treatment conditions or uh, four different treatment groups. Um, you could consider those levels or K. So since the two independent variables, uh, diet and exercise, are each manipulated in two ways, the four cells uh, below, so these shown represent all possible combinations of the treatment conditions. So it says that each IV is manipulated in two ways. So let's take a look at how that is happening. So here we have uh, below 2000 calories and above 2000 calories. So this is gonna be IV number one, which I'm gonna look back at the hypothesis to verify how they worded this and they did word it as diet. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I stay consistent with their wording and put diet. And then I'm gonna look for my other IV. Looks like it's gonna be exercise here. So IV number two is exercise. And then it does have those two conditions, exercise and no exercise. So I have my two IVs with two levels of each IV for a total of one, two, three, four conditions or groups or levels, however you like to word it. So since the two independent variables, diet and exercise are each manipulated in two ways, the four cells shown represent all possible combinations of the treatment condition. So what that means is that there's four groups. There are people that are exercising and eating below 2000 calories, people that are exercising and eating above 2000 calories, people that are eating below 2000 calories and not exercising, and people that are not exercising and eating above 2,000 calories. So inside this block of cells here, um, we have some information that oftentimes we have to calculate ourselves, but in this situation, it's been given to us. So it tells us that this group that's in the below 2,000 and exercise uh, condition, they have an N of five. So there's five people in that group. If I added up all the raw scores, it would total 58. If I squared all the raw scores and then added them up, it would equal 684. And if I took the mean of all their raw scores, uh, so added up all their raw scores, which was 58 and divided by five, I would get a mean of 11.6. So there's the same uh, data, data given in all these cells respective to their groups. And so the first thing that we're going to do with this data is calculate the sum of squares total. And so the way we calculate the sum of squares, the way we calculate the sum of squares total is with this formula right here. So that formula tells us to square all the raw scores and then add them up. And we're gonna subtract that from all the raw scores uh, added up and then squared and divided by big N. So in this case, big N is going to be 20. It says there's 20 male high school students in our sample. And I can verify that because the ends of these groups are all five. So 
uh, 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 is in fact 20. So big N here is 20. So you can see that value uh, placed there in the example. And then here we need, um, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the numerator of that fraction. So on um, the numerator of that, we need all of the raw scores added up. So to get that value, I would just need to go to each individual group and add up the sigma x scores. So 58 plus 71 plus 96 plus 116 is going to equal 341. So then I'm just missing this first portion of the problem here, which is add up all the squared values, uh, all the squared raw scores. So I'm gonna take the squared raw score given for each cell. So 684 plus 1017 plus 1864 plus 2696, I'm gonna write each of those there. And then if I add them up, I would get 6,261. If I were to square all of the raw scores added up and then uh, if, if I were to follow through with that squaring, like the um, formula tells me to do, then that would equal 116,281. If I divide that by 20, I get 5,814.05. So brief side note here, this value is gonna be called the correction factor. Um, we use this value several times throughout uh, our calculation of the entire factorial ANOVA. So rather than do this calculation over and over and over again to get uh, this value, we could just label it as the C, the correction factor. And every time we see this uh, portion of a formula, rather than having to calculate all the way through it, we could just plug in this value um, since we've already calculated it. So sometimes in the formulas, rather than seeing this um, whole formula written out, you would just see a C for correction factor, and then you would know to take this value. Okay, so if you continue on calculating through the sum of squares total, uh, you would take the value of all of your squared raw scores added together, which in this case is 6,261. Subtract that correction factor, and you're going to get 446.95. So if you um, look on your summary table, which is on the next page, you'll notice that down here there is not what we normally see on a summary table, which is the total row. So we're gonna go ahead and add that word total there. And now we have a total row. And we just calculated the sum of squares total and the value that we got was 446.95. So I'm just going to put that there. And I do remember that if I were to add up all the sum of squares, they should equal 446.95. So I haven't shown you how to calculate these yet. We're gonna do that next, um, but they are here in the example word problem um, or in the example summary table. So uh, you could double check if you want just to see that all these sum of squares do add up to the sum of squares total, even in a factorial ANOVA. Okay, so let's look back on the first page and figure out how we got these sums of squares. Okay, so uh, the next calculation is gonna be the sum of squares between groups. And you've done this calculation before, you've seen this formula. Um, the symbol is a little different on a two-way ANOVA because we have uh, sum of squares main effects B. And so to delineate between the two, um, well, in a one-way ANOVA, you saw this as SSB, since in the, uh, in the two-way ANOVA, there's another SSB. Uh, for this, we put SSBG for uh, sum of squares between groups, but it's the same formula you saw before in a one-way ANOVA. Here, uh, there are four. There is space for four groups to be uh, placed into the formula. So let's go ahead and solve through this. So we'll start on the left side uh, here, and so it says to take all of the added up scores, and um, we're going to do that from group one, and that would equal fifty-eight, and then throw that squared symbol after it. You're gonna add that to all of the added up squared, or all of the added up scores from group two, which is 71. We're gonna throw that squared symbol. For the next one, it's 96. Throw that squared symbol in there. And then for above and no exercise, it's 116 and throw that squared symbol in there. And you're gonna divide all that by little n. Little n was five. 
and you're going to minus that from your correction factor. So I'm just going to pull the value down from uh, the sum of squares total example. The 5,814.05 is our correction factor, which we got by calculating this formula. Rather than doing it again, I'm just going to pull it down from the previous problem. Okay, and then I'm going to square all these raw scores. Those values are going to be here. So the first 58 squared is 30, uh, 3,364. 71 squared is 5,041. 96 squared is 9,216. And 116 squared is 13,456. When I add up all those values, I get 31,077. I'm gonna, uh, that's my numerator still over my denominator of five minus my correction factor. So if I go ahead and calculate through this uh, fraction here, or if I do this division here, I would get uh, 6215.40 minus that correction factor is going to give me a sum of squares between groups equal to 401.35. So if I look back on my summary table, uh, an interesting thing happens and that I do not see a 401.35 in my sum of squares. And so that's because this is the between groups. And in a one-way ANOVA, um, we just had one uh, calculation for that. But here, our between groups is going to include um, our diet, our exercise, and our interaction. So if you were to take the values uh, for diet, exercise, and interaction, the sum of square values for those, and add them together, um, you would actually have your between groups uh, total. So you would have, if you were to add these values together, that would give you 401.35. Okay, so that's gonna be your between groups. Well, you know what, I'm just gonna label it the same way it's labeled on the front page. Um, you know what, I'll do BG, BG. Okay, but it's not on the summary table like this because all the values in the sum of squares have to add up to your total. And this is just a subtotal of uh, the main effect A, main effect B in the interaction. Okay, so we don't put it on there, but these three values should total your sum of squares between groups. I'm gonna go ahead and erase that because we didn't, we normally would not put that on there, but we would know that those three um, sum of squares should equal the between group sum of squares. Okay, so we're not gonna put that anywhere on our summary table, but we do need to have that information just to make sure that our main effect A, B, and interaction add up to it. So the main effect A, main effect B, and the interaction should add up to your sum of scores between groups. Okay, our next calculation is going to be the sum of squares within groups. And it's the same exact formula on your, um, as on your one-way ANOVA worksheets. However, um, in this case, we're just going to take the sum of squares total that we calculated minus the sum of squares between groups to get our within. So if we take 446.95 minus 401.35, we'll get that sum of squares within groups of 45.60. And that would be uh, placed right here on our summary table in the sum of squares column and the within groups row. So I know this is my sum of squares within groups. And so now we are going to uh, learn how to calculate the sum of squares for main effect A, main effect B, and then that interaction. And these are the new formulas that we hadn't done yet um, because we didn't have to do this for a one-way ANOVA. So we're doing these uh, calculations for the first time. So we're gonna be calculating main effect A. And for main effect A, what we need to do is we need to take um, the first column here. So we're gonna take below 2,000 calories and we're gonna take the add it up raw score and place that here in the numerator, plus the add it up raw score for below 2000 calories, no exercise, and place that here, 96. We're gonna put those in parentheses and add the squared symbol, and that is all gonna be divided by the ends for both of those groups. So the N for below exercise was five, and the N for below no exercise was five. So I'm gonna put those two fives there. 
Okay, now I am ready to do this next column. So I'm going to take 71 and 116, the added up raw scores for both of those groups, and place them here on my numerator. And then I need to get the ends for both of those groups. So the ends are five. And I'm gonna make sure to put uh, my added up raw scores in parentheses and square them. And then that is going to, uh, oh, and then the next step in the formula is to subtract that correction factor. So I can uh, put the correction factor in here. If I add the two uh, added up raw scores together, I get 154. I'm gonna pull down that squared symbol. If I add the little ends, I get 10. If I add 71 plus 116, I get 187. And then I'm gonna pull that squared symbol in. Five plus five is 10. And we're gonna subtract the correction factor from that. So if I square 154, I get 23,716 divided by, uh, and then remember to divide that by 10. And then 187 squared is 34,969. Throw my denominator in there. Carry down that correction factor. And then when I do the division here for that first uh, column, uh, so it's 23,716 divided by 10, I get 2,371.6. And when I do the division on the next column, so 34,969 divided by 10, I get 3,496.9. Minus my correction factor gives me a sum of squares main effect A of 54.45. So I would place that right here on sum of squares diet, 54.45, okay? Because I did my two columns for diet. So that's my, oh, I did my two columns for diet. So that's my sum of squares, main effect A, columns, or diet. Okay, let's do the main effect for B, which is the rows. So the rows represent IV2 exercise. So main effect B is referring to exercise. And so we're gonna go do the rows here. So we're gonna start with 58 and 71. Place that here in our numerator. Then we're gonna do the rows 90 for no exercise, 96 and 116. Place those here in our numerator. Get the ends for those rows. So the end for exercise is five and five. So I uh, place that down here. And the ends on the no exercise row are five and five. So I'm gonna put that down here. Okay, 58 plus 71 is 129. Pull down my squared symbol. Five plus five is 10. 96 plus 116 is 212. Five plus five is 10. And then it says to put in that correction factor of 5,814.05. And I'm moving down to this next line. 129 squared is 16,641. Don't forget to put the denominator in there. 212 squared is 44,944. Don't forget to put the denominator in there. Correction factor, so minus that correction factor of 5,814.05. And then we're ready to do the division. So the division on that first row is 1,664.1. The division for the no exercise row, 44,944 divided by 10 is 4,494.4. Minus that correction factor gives us a sum of squares for main effect B, which is exercise of 344.45. So if we look on our summary table, we see that there, 334.45. And now the only thing we're missing is this interaction. So let's see how we got the 2.45 on that interaction. First of all, there's a typo here on this worksheet. So where it says sum of squares within groups equals, that should say sum of squares A times B equals to represent the interaction. And so for that, you're gonna take your sum of squares between groups, which is 401.35, minus your sum of square main effects, which is 54.45, minus your sum of squares main effect B, which is 344.45. So you're just gonna subtract and then subtract, and you're gonna get 2.45 for your sum of squares interaction. And so you put that here on your summary table. 
So um, now we have all of our sum of squares in our summary table here. And the next step is to get uh, the degrees of freedom for each. Now there's a lot of different ways to label your groups. Uh, you can label them by main effect, by interaction, by the variable name, or you can uh, name them by your block of cells, so columns and rows. It's a little bit much, I think, but uh, here we have everything labeled as just their variable names or their main effects and interactions. So diet, exercise, and interaction. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you, uh, like our columns, for example, we had uh, been treating as main effect A. So I'm going to just add on there that this is main effect A. And then our rows uh, for exercise, we were we had labeled them as B, so their main effect B. Okay, and then we have the rows by columns, which is your interaction, or we've also been labeling it A times B. So sorry about all the different language there. It's a, a little bit of over information, but that is the different ways in which these sources of variance can be referred to as. At any rate, we're gonna go do our degrees of freedom for diet um, or columns minus one. Um, so the number of columns you have minus one. You're gonna go back to your block of cells for that. And you have one, two columns. So two minus one is going to be how you calculate that. And that would give you a one. So I've written that down here. The degrees of freedom for uh, main effect A is diet, uh, one, or diet is one. So two minus one is one. Okay, and then exercise, same deal. Number of rows minus one. So again, we have one, two rows. So two minus one is one. So then the one was placed right here for degrees of freedom, exercise or degrees of freedom, main effect B. Okay, and then the way you get the degrees of freedom interaction is to take the degrees of freedom column that you just calculated. So here, and you're gonna put it here, so one. And then you're gonna take the degrees of freedom rows that you just calculated and put it there. So I'm gonna take this one and put it there. And you just multiply them together. So one times one equals one. So there is uh, the one for degrees of freedom interaction or degrees of freedom A times B is one. Okay, and then the degrees of freedom within groups calculation is the same as it was on a one-way ANOVA, just N minus K. So the N in this case was 20 and K is the number of groups I have. So I could always just count my cells for that and I have four groups. So that is going to give me a degrees of freedom within groups of 16. And then also I'm gonna go ahead and add my degrees of freedom total in here. So um, the total degrees of freedom calculation is just the same as the one we ANOVA and minus one. So our N was 20 minus one equals 19. So I'm gonna put 19 down here for my degrees of freedom total. And I can verify that that's correct by adding up all of the degrees of freedom. So 16 plus one plus one plus one is 19. So that all works out. And then the next step is to go ahead and do um, your mean square calculations. And so the formulas for those calculations, there's four in this case, are on this uh, top summary table with the formulas in it. So we're gonna go ahead and calculate our mean square for main effect A. And the way we calculate that is by taking the sum of squares column divided by the degrees of freedom column or the sum of squares diet divided by the degrees of freedom diet or you could think of it as the sum of squares main effect A divided by the degrees of freedom main effect A. It's all the same. At any rate, uh, we're gonna take the sum of squares, we're gonna divide it by the degrees of freedom and that's gonna give us a mean square of 54.54. We're gonna do the same thing for the sum of squares uh, main effect B or sum of squares uh, exercise or some squares rows, however you want to word it. So 344.45 divided by one equals 344.45. And then we're going to do the same thing for the interaction. You're going to take the sum of squares interaction divided by the degrees of freedom interaction. So 2.45 is my sum of squares interaction divided by one gives me 2.45. 
Then for my mean square within groups, it's the same as a one-way ANOVA, sum of squares within divided by degrees of freedom within. So 45.60 divided by 16 is uh, gives me a mean square of 2.85. So just like with one-way ANOVA, what we needed to do is divide our between groups mean square into our within groups mean square. So if you remember at the top of this uh, worksheet tutorial, we talked about how if you add up the sum of squares for diet, exercise, and interaction, you would get that um, between groups total. So you can think of a diet interaction and or diet exercise and interaction of being subgroups of that between group source of variance. So these three, diet, exercise, and interaction, make up our between groups. So because of that, we're going to divide each sub between group into our within group. In a one-way ANOVA, we divided our between group into our within group, but here we have three sub between groups, so each one needs to get divided into the within group. So we're gonna start by dividing uh, 54.45 divided by 2.85 is going to equal 19.11. So I put that in the F column. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the mean square um, main effect B, I'm going to take that 344.45 and I'm going to divide it by that 2.85 and that's going to give me 120.86. And then last but not least, I'm going to take the mean square interaction of 2.45 and I'm going to divide it by that 2.85 and that is going to give me an F ratio of 0.86. So now I have three F ratios, and what I need to do is evaluate each F ratio for significance. So that's an easy task when your uh, sub-between group measures are all the same, like they are in this case. But um, in a problem coming up on this worksheet tutorial, the degrees of freedom for your sub-between groups are not gonna be all the same, in which case it's a little more complicated. But for now, since they are all the same, our um, degrees of freedom that we're going to use to look up our F crit values on table G are going to be uh, the degrees of freedom for the between group. And since they're all the same at one, we're good to go by just placing a one there. And then uh, you have your comma after the one in the parentheses, and then you put your degrees of freedom within group. So 16 in this case. So it's your within group um, I'm sorry, it's your between group and your within group that you use on table G to get your uh, crit value at the 0.05, it's 4.49, and at the 0.01, it's 8.53. So again, um, these are found on table G, okay? And so what we need to do is use these crit values to evaluate each of these Fs. So if we were to draw our normal curve, uh, we could put this 0.05 and this 0.01. We're just gonna put them over here so we have enough room. And the 0.05 would be um, starting at 4.49 and the 0.01 would be at 8.53. Okay, so now I'm going to take my F of 19 0.11 that I got for main effect A, that's going to be about right here, so 19.11. That's going to be significant at the P less than 0.01 um, level, so I'm going to put less than 0.01 there. And then I have um, my F for main effect B, in this case it's 120.86, so that would be way the heck over here, 120. Uh, 120.86 and so that's going to be significant p less than 0.01 and then 0.86 would be somewhere over here so sadly our interaction fell in this except h o region at 0.86 and so that is not significant so we put in ns 
Okay, so besides completing a summary table for a factorial ANOVA, you will also be asked to graph and explain an interaction. So I'm going to teach you now how to graph an, inter uh, graph an interaction. And so what you're going to do is uh, put the dv on the y-axis and then one of the ivs on the x-axis with its two levels. So the dv is going to go over here on your y-axis and the IV is going to go down here, the first IV. IV number one, and in this case, or IV A, let's put A. IV A equals a diet. And the DV is percentage of body fat. Okay, so um, for our diet, we had our two levels, and those levels were below 2,000 calories and above 2,000 calories. Okay, and then um, we'll do our numbers over here. You got to start the base of the ordinate at zero so we don't have a wow graph because we are not shady statisticians. And then I'm just gonna go up by fives, 15, 20, 25, okay? And then um, I have my DV represented and my IVA with its two levels, but I am missing my second IV, IVB. So I'm gonna put that up here. Uh, IVB is for exercise, and there's two levels of exercise. There is, uh, here, exercise and no exercise. Oh shoot, I'm all up in the graph. Okay, hold on. Put this over here. A little key. Okay. IVB. IVB, exercise. And it's gonna have its two levels and we're gonna represent exercise by connecting the dots that we plot with a straight line. And we're gonna plot no exercise, or we're gonna connect the dots that we plot for no exercise with a dashed line. Okay, so um, for this, I'm going to need my means so I can come back here to my uh, summary table. And I can see that the mean for below 2,000 calories and exercise is 11.6. So below 2,000 calories, 11.6. Okay. And then uh, below, let's see. And then above 2,000 calories and exercise is 14.6. So 14.6 would be about right here. Or is it 14.6? Oh, it's 14.2, 14.2 would be about right here. So let me just go ahead and label those 14.2 and 11.6. And again, I got those means here from the exercise group. So I'm gonna connect the exercise dots with a straight line, okay? And then I have my no exercise means, so 19.2 and the below 2,000 calories. It's going to be about right here. And then um, my above 2,000 calories, no exercise is going to be 23.2. So these are all values for no exercise. So I'm going to connect them with a dashed line. That's what McKee says. Okay, so now I have graphed this interaction and the last thing I need to do is explain the interaction. So what I'm asking for you to do when you explain the interaction is to first look at your summary table and see which value is significantly different from the rest. Um, in this case, we do not have a significant interaction and because we don't have a significant interaction, there is not a group mean that is significantly different from the rest. So in this case, since we have no significant interaction, when we look at the group means, they're not, uh, they're all pretty similar to each other. Um, because we have a interaction that's not significant, we would just write 
there is no significant interaction between, and then you list your two IVs. So IVA and IVB. Make sure you can see this, yeah. On, and then that's where you would put the DB. So you would say there is no significant interaction between diet and exercise on body fat percentage. I do not believe this is a real study. Okay. And so that's how you graph and explain the interaction. Okay, so here we are on page three of your factorial ANOVA worksheet. This one says 64 school children were given a learning task. So I know N is 64. Half of them were rewarded by the experimenter for each correct response, either by a verbal reward of right or a non-verbal reward of candy. The other half were punished for each incorrect response, either by a verbal punishment, wrong, or a non-verbal punishment, an unpleasant sound, like a buzzer, I don't know, nails on a chalkboard or something. Each child was evaluated on the learning task in terms of number of correct items. So evaluated or measured, I know this is gonna be my DV, the learning task, and the operational definition is number of correct items. Okay, so DV, and then I have my two IVs. I have um, a uh, reward and punishment. And then I have either a verbal or a nonverbal. Okay. So uh, when they were rewarded, they either got a verbal reward of right or a nonverbal reward of candy. And when they were punished, they either got a verbal response of wrong or a nonverbal uh, response of just an annoying sound. Okay. So uh, down here in my block of cells, I have um, all of the group means here in the center of each cell. So the group that was rewarded verbally had a mean of 35.31. That was the mean number of correct items they got on a learning task, as opposed to like the candy group. Uh, so the candy group or the group that was rewarded with candy they got a mean number of correct items equal to 13.38 on the learning task. And then the group that uh, was punished verbally, so they were told wrong, their mean score was 32.63. And the group that um, was punished non-verbally with the sound had a group mean of 38.69. So then if I wanted to, I could put these means out here as well. Um, so the mean for uh, verbal rewards, I would take 35.31, or I'm sorry, not verbal rewards, just any verbal behavior, whether it be reward or punishment. I would take 35.31 plus 32.63 divided by two, because I have two numbers, and the mean for verbal is 33.97. And then I could get the mean for nonverbal by adding 13.38 uh, plus 38.69 9 is going to give me 26.03 and then I could get the means for the reward people that were in the reward group so 35.31 plus 13.38 divided by 2 is 24.34 and then um, for punishment the 32.63 mean plus the mean of 38.69 divided by 2 it's going to give me a mean of 35.66. So I'm not going to really do anything with these numbers um, other than on my home, on your homework that's coming up. You're going to have to put them in. But other than that, you don't really need them for uh, much other than to just have them here outside your summary tables and to know them. Um, but when, what you will be asked to do is graph and explain an interaction. And you can uh, do that before you even get your uh, F ratio and then evaluate it using table G. Um, you can do that by graphing it and then just looking at it and seeing if it looks like it's interacting or if it looks like it's going to interact. So I'll show you what I mean by that. But first we have to plot these points. So we don't plot the points outside the cells. We plot the points inside the cells. 
So here it wants the points, for, uh, the mean scores for reward. So those scores were 13.38, uh, the nonverbal candy, 13.38. And then um, the 35.31, 35.31. So you can write 13.38 and 35. 0.31 just so you know you have them represented and then for the punishment we're going to do uh 38.69 so that's about right here and then the 32.63 is about right here Okay, so now we have to connect those dots. And so uh, we have our verbal that's gonna be connected with a dash line. So the verbal was the 35.31 and the 32.63. So I'm gonna connect those two dots with a dash line. It's kind of confining. Okay, that's not my best work. Okay. And then we're gonna do the other two, 13.38, 38.69 with a straight line. Okay, so just by looking at this, um, I can see that I should have a significant interaction when I work through my summary table because my two lines are crossing. Um, if the lines are parallel to each other, like we had on our first example on this worksheet, or pretty close to parallel, then we are not expecting a significant interaction. But if they are crossing like they are here, or if they're uh, perpendicular, meaning they look like if they continued on, they would cross eventually, then you would say that you are expecting to have a significant interaction. So um, we will see if we do have a significant interaction here, we're expecting that we will. And if we do, we will then explain that interaction uh, down here, but we'll save that for later. So first I just wanna check my summary table to my block of cells and make sure I have all my labels straight so I know um, which calculations are going where or which values are going where on my summary table. So this one tells me that the verbal, nonverbal um, IV is going to be main effect A. On our previous example, A was up here, uh, but now it is down here. So you have to pay attention to the summary table. And if it tells you where to put your, uh, which one to make your main effect A and which one to make your main effect B, then you wanna go ahead and follow that. If not, it's up to you. And once you choose which variable is A, that's fine, but it just has to remain that, uh, it has to remain variable A throughout the whole calculation. But here it tells us to put make variable A verbal and nonverbal and then reward and punishment make that uh, variable B. And so um, here it's giving us the sum of squares. We don't have to calculate through them ourselves. We could just fill in the blanks on this summary table. And so to do that, um, we could add up all of these values here and then subtract from the total. And when we add up all of what constitutes our between group subgroups, when we add them all up and subtract them from the total, what's left over is our within groups oops, of 21,048.38. Okay, so now we're going to get our degrees of freedom calculations. And so for uh, degrees of freedom A, what we're going to do here is take the number of rows minus one. And I'm starting with rows instead of columns like in the previous example because A is representing the rows. So the number of rows I have are two. So two minus one is one. And then um, for punishment, I'm going to take the number of columns minus one because B represents columns in this case. So I have two columns, two minus one is one. And then for my interaction effect, I just take my degrees of freedom A and multiply it by my degrees of freedom B. So I just calculated these degrees of freedom right now that just happened. So one times one. So this is my degrees of freedom A and this is my degrees of freedom B. So one times one equals one. I don't like how I did that. I got a race. Okay, so that's going to be one. One. Okay, and then our last one, our within groups, is our good old n minus k calculation. So in this case, uh, n was 64 and k was 4. 
So 64 minus 4 would be 60. So then I can verify that that all works out by seeing if um, my between groups, subgroups, and my within group, so all my degrees of freedom values add up to the total. And in this case, 60 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 does equal 63. So now what I am going to do is get my mean squares. Um, and so to do that, I'm just going to divide across on all these sum of squares. So I'm going to divide each sum of square with its degree of freedom. And the first three are all 1. So it's just going to be 2047.56 divided by 1 is 2047.56. And then the same all the way down, 1008.06 divided by 1 is 1008.06. 3,136 uh, divided by 1 is 3,136. Okay, so now we need our um, mean square for our within groups. And so we're going to take 21,048.38 divided by 60. And that's going to give us 350.81. So now I'm ready to go ahead and um, calculate through my mean squares. Oh, I'm sorry, calculate uh, through my F ratios using my mean squares. So I'm going to take each mean square from my um, subgroup of my between groups and divide it into the within group. So I'm going to start with main effect A or verbal, nonverbal. The mean square for that is 2047.56. I'm going to divide that by my within group's mean square of 350.81. And that's going to give me an F ratio for main effect A equal to 5.84. Then I'm going to take my mean square uh, for main effect B, divide it into my within group's uh, mean square of 350.81. And when I do that, I get 2.87. And then last but not least, I'm going to take my mean square for my interaction, divide it by my within group. So 3,136 divided by 350.81 gives me 8.94. Okay, and so then what I need to do is evaluate each one of these Fs for significance. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to look back here at my degrees of freedom. And in this case, all of my sub between groups are equal to one. So I'm good to go. I can just put a one in the parentheses for the degrees of freedom, uh, the one before the comma. And then after the comma, I'm going to put my degrees of freedom within groups of 60. Okay, and then I'm going to go to table G. And I'm going to look up the crit values uh, using 1 and 60. And at the 0.05, the crit value is an even 4. And uh, the 0.01 using uh, 1 and 60 degrees of freedom is 7.08. So now I'm going to go through each F and see which ones are bigger than my crit values and where. And then apply the correct significance level or um, if not, not significant. Okay, so the first one is 5.84. 5.84 is a bigger number than 4, so I know I'm going to get to reject HO. Um, but is um, 5.84 bigger than the 0.01? Can I do better? Let's see. So the 0.01 crit value is 7.08, and 5.84 is not bigger than 7.08, so I'm not going to be able to reject P less than 0.01. But again, 5.84 is a bigger number than 4, so I am able to reject P less than 0.05. Then I'm going to look at the next one. Um, the F ratio for main effect B is 2.87. So I'm going to look at my 0.05 crit value, and 2.87 is not a bigger number than um, 4. So I know it's certainly not going to be a bigger number than my 0.01 value. So sadly, I have to mark that one NS for not significant. And then my interaction F ratio of 8.94 is bigger than my 0.05 crit value of 4. But can I do better? Is 8.94 a bigger number than my 0.01 crit value of 7.08? But yes, it is. So I get to reject HO at the best level, 0 0.01, meaning I'm 99% sure of this finding. Okay, so um, I do see that I have a very significant interaction effect, and I was um, 
anticipating that because I drew this graph and the lines cross, so I saw that there would be an interaction. So now I have to um, explain the interaction and you will be asked to do that um, on your homework and on uh, quizzes in the final exam. So what you would write if there's a significant interaction is uh, there was a significant interaction There was a significant interaction, and then I am going to need to explain um, basically where that interaction comes from. So what I'd like for you to do is go to your block of cells and see which number is significantly different from the other numbers. So uh, it looks like 13 is significantly different from all the other numbers because all those numbers are in their 30s and this one is way down in the uh, 10s. So 13.38, is going to be um, our mean that we're gonna focus on here to explain our interaction. So we're gonna say that uh, the students, and I do want you to do that, I do want you to circle the group that's significantly different from the other groups and then describe that group when you're doing your homework or quizzes um, so I know which group you're referring to. So then um, you wanna make sure that you include both IVs and DVs in your uh, description of the interaction. So here I'm gonna write students uh, rewarded non-verbally And again, I know that because I have uh, this value circled. This mean is the lowest mean. It's significantly different from others, and it's in the nonverbal reward um, intersection. So reward, nonverbal. So students rewarded nonverbally. In other words, the students that got candy. So maybe I'll put IE got candy here just to be clear. Um, IE got candy for correct answers performed, and this is where I'm going to mention my DV, the worst, so how do I know that they performed the worst? Because it was uh, the mean, or the, the child was evaluated on the learning task in terms of number of correct items. So they got the lowest number of correct items. That's how I know they did the worst. So students rewarded non-verbally, in other words, they got candy, performed the worst on the, and this is where you're gonna put the DV, uh, learning task. Okay, and so you just wanna verify that you do have both of your IVs mentioned and your DV. So here you have uh, rewarded, so that was the IV um, for main effect B where we were looking at reward versus punishment. And then we have non-verbally, and so that was the uh, one level of the uh, variable A where we're comparing verbal and non-verbal. So I have both variables represented here, and then also I have my DV represented here, okay, uh, what we're measuring. All right, so that is how you do a um, two-way factorial ANOVA where there are two levels of each variable and you have a significant interaction. Okay, so here we have page four of the worksheet and this is another factorial ANOVA, but this one is an example of a two by three. So this one has two IVs, um, um, and I know that because there's two spaces here. Um, and the first IV has uh, two levels of it, and the second IV has three levels of it. So uh, when I look down here at my summary table, it says that main effect A is uh, the eyes, and then main effect B is the head movement. So I'm going to label those up now. But let me go ahead and read the problem. So countless factors affect depth perception, but two key factors are whether you use one or two eyes, and that's main effect A, um, and then whether your head is stationary or in motion, and that's main effect B, and it looks like the movement options are no movement, slow movement, or moderate movement. And then participants were required to align two small rods from a distance of six meters 
And the data consisted of the distance between those two rods in millimeters. So the smaller the distance between the two rods, the better the depth perception of the individual. Um, so what we need to start out by doing is graphing our interaction and seeing if we're expecting to have a significant interaction or not. And so um, we're gonna start with the Let's see, it looks like we're gonna start with head movement. So the no head movement had uh, nine and three. So we'll plot those three and nine. And then the slow head movement uh, had five and 2.4 as its means. So five and 2.4, be about there in the middle. And then moderate is 3.4 and two. So two we'll put there, 3.4, right about there. Okay, so now I'm gonna connect uh, the one eye means with a dashed line. And so those are nine, five, and 3.4. So here's nine, five, and 3.4, yeah. So those are gonna be connected with dashed lines. And then uh, it says to connect the two eyes with a Solid line, so that's three, 2.4, and two. So three, 2.4, and two. Let's connect those with the straight line. Okay, so these lines are not uh, parallel to each other, but they also don't intersect yet. However, if I saw this, um, I would assume that there was going to be a significant interaction because if the lines were to continue, they would definitely interact or cross. So here I am expecting to have a significant interaction um, um, between my head movement and number of eyes. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is get our uh, within groups. And so to do that, we would add up all of our sub between groups, 83.33, of 57.27 and the interaction of 28.47. So if I were to add all those up, it would equal my sum of squares between groups, uh, which would be what well, sum of squares between groups would equal 169.07. So if I took 169.07 and subtracted it from the sum of squares total of 239.47, I would get a sum of squares within groups of 70.40. And then I'm gonna to need to calculate my degrees of freedom. And so I'm gonna start by uh, calculating the degrees of freedom for A, which is gonna be my rows here. So it's gonna be the number of rows minus one, and I have one, two rows, so two minus one is one. And then uh, for movement, it's gonna be uh, main effect B, which is gonna be my column. So number of columns is one, two, three, minus one is two. And then for my interaction, I just take those two degrees of freedom I just calculated and I multiply them. So two times one is two. Then I check my work by making sure all these degrees of freedoms add up to the degrees of freedom total of 29. 24 plus 2 is 26, plus 2 more is 28, plus 1 is 29. So now I'm ready to calculate my mean squares. I'm just going to divide across. 83.33 divided by 1 is going to give me 83.33. 57.27 divided by 2 is going to give me 28.64. And 28.47 divided by 2 is going to give me 14.24. And my mean square within groups is going to be 70.40 divided by 24, and that's going to give me 2.93. Okay, now I'm going to take all three of these sub between groups and divide them by my within group one at a time. So I'm going to start with 83.33 divided by 2.93 would give me 28.44. 28.64 divided by 2.93 would give me 9.77. 14.24 divided by 2.93 would give me 4.86. And so then I need to evaluate each of these Fs to determine if they're significant or not. 
So I have to get my degrees of freedom so I can look up my crit values on table G. So I'm going to go over to my sub between groups and hopefully they're all the same. No, they're not the same. So here I have a situation where my uh, degrees of freedom A and my degrees of freedom B are different. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to get um, crit values for main effect A and main effect B. And then I'll show you what we're going to do with the interaction in a second. So first I'm gonna take uh, the degrees of freedom for main effect A, which is one, and that within groups degrees of freedom of 24. I'm gonna place that in my parentheses here and go to table G and get my crit values. So on table G using one and 24, I get a 0.05 crit value of 4.26 and a 0.01 crit value of 7.82. And then I'm going to get um, crit values for main effect B. And so for that, I'm gonna use two and 24, my degrees of freedom for main effect B and my within groups. So I'm gonna put that two and 24 right here. And so the two and 24 on table G at the 0.05 level gives me a crit value equal to 3.40. And at the 0.01, it gives me a crit value equal to 5.61. So then what I need to do is evaluate each F accordingly. So the F for main effect A is going to be evaluated by the main effect A crit values. So I would take uh, 28.4 and I would ask myself, self, is 28.44 a bigger number than 4.26? Yes, it is. So we have significance at the 0.05 level, but can I do better? Is 28.44 a bigger number than 7.82? Yes, it is. So I get to reject at the highest level, the 0.01. Very excited about that. Okay, and then I am going to take uh, my main effect B, F ratio of 9.77 and compare it to my main effect B values, which are the ones down here on this second row. So I'm going to take the F ratio of 9.77 and ask myself, self, is 9.77 a bigger number than 3.40? Why, yes it is. So I know I get to reject at the 0.05 level, but can I do better? Is 9.77 a bigger number than 5.61? Yes, it is. So I know I get to reject at the 0.01 level. And then here's the deal with your interaction effect. Uh, you just have to be one of these four. So you got four crit values to work with. You just have to be one and you wanna take the one with the best outcome. So I'm gonna take my 4.86 and I'm gonna see if it beats uh, the 0.05, 4.26. Yep, it does. So I already know I get to reject. Okay, if it didn't beat it here, let's say this was a 5.26, for example, then I would just check down here and I'd go, oh yeah, it does, it beats this one, 3.40, so I get to reject, okay. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing and check against my 0.01, so I'm gonna see this 4.86, is that a bigger number than 7.82? No, it's not, so I can't reject here. Let's see, is 4.86 a bigger number than this 0.01? Is it bigger than 5.61? No, it's not, so I can't reject. So my um, best case was 0.05, so I'm gonna reject at the 0.05. But had one of these been a smaller number, one of these 0.01 crit values been a smaller number uh, than this F, which here they were both bigger. But if even one of them was smaller, it doesn't matter which one, then you would have been able to uh, reject at the 0.01 if your F was larger. So you just gotta beat one and then you take the best outcome. Um, so now we want to explain this interaction effect because we do have one. Um, you'll notice it's a 0.05, so it's not as strong as the interaction effect on the previous example where they crossed on our chart. Here, if they continued on, they would eventually cross. Um, and we also do have a little bit weaker significance, but nonetheless significance. So if we wanted to explain this interaction effect, uh, we would say, first of all, that there is a significant interaction and now I'm going to look where that interaction is. So I'm going to look for the value that's the most different from the others. So I would say uh, this one here, 9, is significantly bigger than the others. So I'm going to um, explain the interaction there. So um, I would write this means 
that participants using one eye and no head movement, using one eye, because I'm describing this cell, and that re represents variable A, so I checked that off my checklist, um, and no head movement, and that represents variable B, so I got that one covered. Okay, no head movement, so variable B and A have been accounted for, okay? This means that participants, participants using one eye and no head movement had the most, and I know it was the most amount of errors because it's the biggest number, the most amount of errors, um, and this, uh, which indicates the worst depth perception. Okay, and so depth perception is my DV. So I know I have that DV represented here. And so um, I have both my IVs and my DV in my explanation of the interaction. And that is a two by three factorial ANOVA. Okay, that's it for chapter 12. Thanks for listening. Um, have a great week or day, and don't forget to reach out to the tutors. Talk to you next time.